almost a case of the uh, tortoise and the hare. Eric, he's always running around. And Marita, she tends to be sort of cool, calm, and collected. It's an interesting pair. You got this, Marita! I'm like a sledgehammer, and she's like a sword. Sledgehammer's pretty risky to bring in battle, but if it, it lands, it's definitely more painful. I'm gonna cook a lot, because that's what I do with my speed. And she's gonna cook simple, refined food and probably smaller portions. I am the total opposite of Eric. He does everything with brisk in it. I am naturally clumsy, so I like to take my time. I'm making a soup inspired by my favorite meal uh, from my Sunday lunch. All fresh ingredients and it's absolutely delicious. I think you can tell a lot about a cook in the way that they make a soup. She's actually very gifted when it comes to layering all those Caribbean Trinidadian flavors. A soup, to me, is just too simple and plain for a finale dish. It's got to be really good to impress me. Is your soup here? Oh, sorry, Girl. Chef. Oh, my God. I am so sorry. Chef Claudio is wearing my soup. This is definitely not a good start to today. All over his jacket. Oh, my God. Oh. I must say, it's quite delicious, actually. Really? Since I didn't win the dim sum challenge, and my grandpa's here this time, I can't let him down, and I gotta bang it out with these dumplings. These dumplings are from scratch, and they taste amazing. And this is, like, the first dish my grandpa taught me. Except I'm adding a bit more flavor, a bit more me in it. Eric, staying with very Asian influences, his braised pork, his soy flavorings, although with ketchup. Is that traditionally used in, in Definitely, uh, Chinese yes. cuisine? Yes, it is. Really? Believe me, it is. Eric, I see your father up there. His eyes glued to the station. Have you done this pork before? Uh, no. You have not learned how to cook pork belly from your grandfather? Are you kidding? No, he doesn't really use pork belly. What does he use then? Pork butt, pork shoulder. Like... Why didn't you use that? He's master chef. Pork belly is definitely more elevated, and I think it tastes better personally. Nice. You got to keep focused. Yeah, chef. All right? Good luck. cooking with salted pigtail. It's a very cheap cut of meat, but it's packed with flavor and lots of fat, so it's delicious. Marita looks like she's falling behind here. Is her pigtail fried? That's what she's just been cutting up now. I can see the pork belly coming out. Ah, oh, buddy! That looks Eric. amazing, Eric! Oh, yeah. It looks hey, good. The color looks beautiful. You had a chance to see these amazing dishes, but only Alvin, Michael, and I will be lucky enough to taste them. Let's go. I'm pretty confident in my flavors. This dish is like my grandpa on a plate. He taught me like this traditional Chinese barbecue pork and dumplings. The portions may be small, but the flavor is big. Well done. You only had an hour to cook some very complicated appetizers. Well, we're looking forward to tasting both your dishes. Marita, ladies first. Please bring your plate up. I wanted to take something that's traditional, Trinidadian, and take it up a notch. I have a pumpkin callaloo soup, a coconut lime creme fraiche, a nice breadfruit chip on top, and some lime pepper sauce. Marita, I quite like what you've done, presenting the garnish and then serving the soup separately on the side. It's a nice way to help elevate the service of a soup. So well done on that. Thank you, Chef. Marita, the flavors are absolutely delicious. The gentle heat, the creaminess, and then garnishing it with these wonderful jewels of pumpkin, the crispy fried pork tail, the flavors of the cooked down carrots and onions, the little shadow Benny, the contrasts. This is an elevated Caribbean soup.
Your presentation has improved dramatically. I mean, this is restaurant presentation. The taste, absolutely spot on. I mean, I would come back again, again, and again for the soup. It's a beautifully balanced soup. What I find extraordinary about it is that you've taken ingredients from your homeland and you combine them so brilliantly with some Western ingredients as well. You just left me wanting more, so it's stunning. Thank you, chef. All right, Eric, your turn, bring it up. Judges really praise Marita's soup. That makes me really nervous. It was pretty much close to flawless. I made a crispy pork belly with a vegetable dumpling and a wasabi mayo with a soy reduction. This is a very ambitious dish. To get a crispy pork belly done in an hour is not easy. Eric, first of all, you have put a lot on this plate. Pork belly, absolutely tender inside and crispy. So spot on, perfect. The dumpling, this is restaurant quality. This is something I would love to serve in my restaurant. Pork belly, it's not the easiest thing in the world to cook. And you've been able to maintain that moist, tender succulence that I love and look for in a really great pork belly. Thank you, Chef. It is delicious. The dumplings, I think you did a great job. You can see the vegetables, how they've been cut with such precision through it. The dish was amazing. Unfortunately, the pork I have here is actually quite dry. The fat does not run completely through the entire pork belly. You end up with pieces that have a little more fat. Uh, the dumplings were absolutely delicious. Overall, I think the dish has some strengths, but the pork for me was dry. Please go back to the kitchen and clear your stations. Thank you, Fisher. Thank you. You have two different cooks from two different parts of the country going about this challenge in two completely different ways. One is going luxury and the other one's going very humble simplicity. Agreed, they are worlds apart as they are from West Coast to East Coast. I want to show the judges that yes, I can do foie gras, I can butter poach lobster, and guess what? I can actually plate and make a cracker to top it all off. Sweetbreads are my favorite dish to eat at a restaurant. Sweetbread is the thymus gland of veal or a calf. I've never had sweetbread with tomatoes. It's going to be a really unique match. These particular tomatoes, I'm going to poach in olive oil. I'm going to make a jelly, and I'm also going to make a foam. I'm going to serve some raw, and then I'm going to pickle the green tomatoes. I love making common ingredients beautiful. David. Yes, Chef. Uh, aren't you afraid that this dish is not really sophisticated enough? I know you're trying to elevate, but Lynn is doing lobster and foie gras, and you're doing tomato? I'll compete against foie gras any day with my tomatoes. How are you going to marry tomato and sweetbread? The richness of the sweetbreads gets beautifully paired with the acidity of the tomatoes. You have inspired a lot of people. Who knows? You may even inspire me. Thank you, Chef. Maybe. <laughs> Lynn, what are you making over here? A medley of foie gras and lobster. And I'm making a homemade poppy seed cracker for the foie gras mousse. Wow, that's ambitious. How are you going to make sure the foie gras is perfect? I am going to make sure my pan is really, really hot. I'm going to use three different pans for the three different pieces. I can't wait to try this, Lynn. Good luck. Thank you. David has just taken his sweetbreads out, and whilst they're hot, he's starting to peel off that very thin layer of membrane. That could be quite difficult. If it's not done properly, and if you don't remove that little membrane, it's tough. Bring it home, David. Bring Thanks, it home. guys. You got it, buddy. That's a hot sweet bread. 20 minutes. You have 20 minutes left. Nice. Nice. Lynn, she's got so many delicate things to put together on the plate at the last minute. Nice job, Lynn. Nice, Lynn. Beautiful, hun. Oh. Our pan's on fire. I certainly don't want to be tasting the charred foie gras. Flame's too high on that burner. Five minutes! Better be 
thinking about plating soon. Look at this, he is trembling. Take it easy, David. Study those hands, you know you can. Kind of feeling the pressure here. With the title at stake, my hands would be shaking too. how incredible Lynn's play looks. Oh, there goes the spiral cracker. One minute! You have one minute left! Come on, you can do it! Okay. 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 One word. Incredible. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one! Lynn, David, judging by the gallery's reaction and what we can see, you've both plated very impressive appetizers. But as I always say, pace is king. Please follow us into the banquet room of your dishes. You had 60 minutes to create your appetizers, and it appears that you've both done a spectacular job. Let's hope they taste as good as they look. Lynn, please bring your dish forward. I want everything on my plate to be perfect. My dish is a lobster and foie gras surf and turf, served with a homemade poppy seed cracker. It's very impressive, and is definitely restaurant quality plating. Thank you, chef. Let's have a taste. When I was watching you cook the pan-fried foie gras, and I saw this enormous plume of smoke, I thought for sure you had destroyed that foie gras. But it was seasoned beautifully, caramelized on both sides. You nailed that piece of foie gras. This has to be one of the best surf and turfs I've ever had. Thank you. Moose is difficult to make, period. And I must say, you did fantastic job. The lobster meat gives it a rich taste of the sea, which goes very nicely with foie gras. What really impresses me is this beautiful cracker because it cuts into richness. Beautiful. Thank you. You've nailed every component. It's amazing to see how you've evolved. You have this confidence now that wasn't there before you came here. Incredible. Thank you. David, Please bring up your dish. I'm just hoping that this appetizer dish was a good idea. My dish is tomatoes five ways with crispy sweet breads and a salsa verde. It looks beautiful. It's like a garden with little rocks. It's good to take nature as inspiration when you present a plate. David, the foam, it's one of the most innovative things I've ever tried. It goes from a solid form to liquid. It just pops in your mouth, but one small misstep. You left the outer membrane of the sweet bread. That's what's making it tough. It's an easy misstep to make. But overall, fantastic dish. The pickled tomatoes, the salted tomato, I love green tomato. That was wonderful. And the sweet bread. To me, it worked, and it worked well. Did you inspire me? A little. But it's difficult to inspire the demon chef a lot. It's interesting that you chose a sweet bread to go with the tomatoes, because it's a unique and interesting combination that, in fact, does work. Other than that little chew that I had, the crispiness of it was right on the money. Come on, come on, Mary! Here it is, Jim. Let's go, buddy. 
These two home cooks have different strengths and different weaknesses. Jeremy is an absolute speed demon in the kitchen. Mary is a little bit slower, tends to get a little bit flustered, but she comes on really, really strong when it comes to plating and those finishing techniques. Beautiful technique, Mary. First thing I do is get my bison cut and seasoned and searing right away. I'm doing bison tataki. It's a shout out to Manitoba. The bison is on our flag. Tataki is obviously a traditional Japanese dish. Piece of protein that's seared on the outside, and it has to literally be raw in the middle. One tip, and even the restaurant uses it, they partially freeze that protein before they slice it very thin. Uni is a very powerful flavored seafood. Uni is a sea urchin, and inside is the golden part. That's what people eat. It's like taking a bite of the sea. The dish sounds absolutely delicious. I need sugar. I have sugar here. Look at that. I'm surprised. Even at this level, at the finale, they're still helping each other. This is so Canadian. That it is. You know, I love the concept of Mary's elevated borscht. Borscht is typically a hearty red beet soup, but I'm making a golden beet borscht. Mary's a master at taking classic traditional food ideas and elevating them and giving them a little bit of a twist. I'm also making beet cured trout. Typically, when you're curing fish, you need 24 hours to really get the flavors in there. I don't have that. So I need to juice the beets and really bump up the flavor in the marinade. The raw beet juice could be a bit harsh, a bit too earthy. So I hope she gets that right balance. Thank you so much, Mary. Right. Hi, Mary. Hi, Chef Michael. How are you? So you've chosen to do borscht. I have. And this is not any ordinary borscht, though. It's going to be served cold, but also raw. Exactly. Any concern in slicing that piece of trout nice and thin and evenly? I'm actually doing it in little triangle medallions. It's going to be bright, fun. It's going to look like me on a plate. <laughs> <laughs> look forward to trying it. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Chef. Oh. Jeremy, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Uh, I got most of my components on the go. This is going to open last minute. Fresh unis. Fresh live sea urchin. Those are beautiful. So where are you at with your bison right now? My bison is already seared and it's chilling, so it gets a bit stiff so I can make nice, thin slices of it. This right here, Chef, is one of my favorite sauces to make. I love tataki sauce. Taste it. Wow. That's insane. That is... That's the most delicious thing I've ever had from you here in this kitchen. Yes, Thank you, Chef. Wow. 15 minutes, Chef. 15 minutes left. Mary is just starting to take her marinated trout out of her beet mixture there. Yeah. And that is a messy job. Curing takes sometimes days. The only protein on this plate is that fish. And if it's not cured properly, the dish won't work. Now, her idea was to cure that trout in the beet juice but I don't think there was enough time to achieve that cure. Pat, she's squeezing some lemon juice onto it now. That'll speed up a little bit more of a cure there. That's a smart move. Five minutes, you got five minutes. Better start plating. I'm cutting into my bison, and I don't like the thickness of the cuts. The way that he's hacking through that bison right now, he's kind of tearing the meat. Jeremy's actually pounding it to make sure that he has that even thickness right around. Well, that's a good comeback. But he hasn't even opened those live sea urchin yet. They take a while to process. This is the opening to my menu. Everything needs to be perfect on it. Oh, look at that pretty color. Three minutes, you have three minutes left, come on! Look at Jeremy. I don't see those live sea urchins. How is he going to pull this off? Here we go. Here we go. He's, he's about to open up his sea urchins. Wow. One minute and one minute left. Come on, let's hustle. Let's go. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. really good. It's exactly how I wanted it to look. The fish is nice and pink, and it tastes beady. I'm really, really happy. I love how it's plated. I'm going to win this appetizer round because of my flavors. Mary and Jeremy, please follow us into the banquet room with your dishes. Please bring
bring your dish forward. This tasting is so different than any I've done before. First off, there's a table. The judges are sitting in front of me. This is super terrifying and legit. <laughs> I did a take on borscht. There's little pillows of a horseradish goat cheese, beet cured trout, and caraway breadcrumb. I suggest we all dig in. Mary, this trout is a little flat in flavor. The cure didn't fully sort of take place. But what I really love about this, that acidic hit that you get, absolutely wonderful. Works really well with the earthiness of those beets. Love the bright color. It is borscht in a very modern kind of way. This is sort of new, energetic, vibrant thinking. Overall, a great dish. Well, Mary, it's colorful. It's fresh. The taste to me was just right. The trout, the cream, and that crunchy crumb all adds complexity and balance to this dish. Thank you very much. When you eat everything together, the goat's cheese, the soup, the herbs, the trout, all the textures, all the flavors, they just sing. It's really delicious. Thank you. OK, Jeremy, please bang up your dish. I'm super proud of this dish. I just want to win. That's all that's going through my mind. A bison tataki with uni cream, fried lotus chips, and a tataki sauce. Jeremy, the meat could be a little bit more unified in the way you cut it. You know, one of the pieces here is very thin. This one's a little bit thicker. My advice to you is take that large piece of bison, cut it into quarters. They chill faster, and when you cut them, they're very easy to cut, opposed to having one large piece. But other than that, the thought process behind this dish is really that of a very accomplished chef. Complex, delightful, it's really fantastic. Thank you. Jeremy, there are so many things on this dish. Textures and tastes that you discover as you start eating. The creaminess of the uni, that adds that wonderful backbone of rich flavor to that bison. These are wonderful flavors that come together beautifully on a plate like this. Thank you. Jeremy, this is by far your most creative dish. The combinations, the complexity, the texture, it's like Asia meets Manitoba. Thank you, Chef. Now we need a few moments to discuss in private. Please head back to the kitchen and prepare for round two. Thank, Thank you. you. These two menus sound spectacular. It seems to me as if they've taken comfort foods, and their plan is to elevate it to MasterChef Canada standards. My entire menu is based on some of my very favorite childhood memories and dishes. My first dish is octopus and chips. It's a riff on fish and chips, which I had pretty much every Sunday at my grandmother's as a kid. This transports me right back to my childhood. Oh, having my family here is amazing. I feel the pressure, though. Go, 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 go. I grew up eating Latin American food at least twice a week. <laughs> so I'm doing a Mexican street style corn panna cotta. Typically, you think of panna cotta as a dessert. She's turned it upside down and made an appetizer out of it, a savory approach to a panna That's cotta. That's a smart move. I'm also creating an amuse bouche, which is a watermelon shooter to kind of cleanse the palate. I am incredibly confident in these flavors. I gotta pound these tentacles, get them nice and tender, or else they're gonna be really hard and not enjoyable to eat. Octopus are very, very difficult to cook. You know, if you undercook it, it's very tough and chewy. And if you overcook it, it's dry and chewy. There you go. And I think he's gonna put it into a pressure cooker. It takes a long time to get the perfect cook on that octopus. That is gonna be right down to the wire. I'm gonna get my octopus in the pressure cooker for exactly 30 minutes. The irony in the situation is I'm literally in a big pressure cooker. Yeah! 30 minutes until the first dish must come out. I tell you, this challenge, it's a marathon. We're still in the appetizer round, but I see Taya. She's getting her pork belly 
into the pressure cooker. It's important to get this going now so that it's nice and tender by the time I take it out for the entree. That is really smart. That'll give it lots of time to get it cooked, tender, and juicy. I know that even with the pressure cooker, pork will take some time. So I want to throw it in the appetizer so I don't have to worry about it in the entree round. Trevor, how you doing? Chef, I'm doing good. What stage are you at right now? Well, right now I got my pressure cooker on for my octopus. This is some lemon aioli I'm going to be making. It smells great already. Thank you. I hear that you have a photograph uh, of someone that's oh, inspired you. There we go. So that is my aunt Tracy. She actually uh, owned a catering company her entire life. And as early as I can remember, I was busting tables for her and making roast beef and Yorkshire pudding. How old were you when you were doing that? Uh, nine, ten years old. Good luck. Remain focused. Thank you, Chef. Hey there, Taya. Chef Michael. So three hours, three courses. Yes. A lot to get done. A lot to get is done. Is there one element that is going to give you the biggest concern? The panna cotta setting is my biggest concern. So as long as that goes well, I think I'll be OK. And I see you are doing something to the corn here. I'm just roasting the corn so they get a nice char. There'll be a layer on top of the panna cotta. It'll look like Mexican street style corn. But then when you cut into it, it'll be a nice creamy corn panna cotta. Interesting. Good luck with it. Thank you, Chef. Good job, Tay. You got it, Taya. 15 minutes, you have 15 minutes left. I have to nail the cook on the octopus. There is no room for error. Anything less, anything more, and this could sink me. Here is a defining moment for Trevor. He's now checking to see how the octopus has been cooked. I pull the octopus out of the pressure cooker. It is perfect, it's so tender. <laughs> yeah. How am I doing, guys? Great. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm on track. And I know I have enough time to make every plate perfect. But the panna cotta is absolutely vital. If my panna cotta doesn't set, it's just like this bleh, blob. And I might as well just give the first round to Trevor. Oh, my gosh. Looking good. Ooh. Okay, wait, it's crumbling. The look I'm going for is a whole piece of charred corn on top of the panna cotta. This isn't good. It's falling apart. I gotta get this off. She's really struggling with the corn there. Come on, Taya. I just need to pick my other corn and pray for the best. This one's good, this one's good. Five minutes, you have five more minutes left. Both cooks are bringing this down to the wire. I mean, Taya has already started plating. Her dish looks incredible. And Trevor's got nothing on his plates right now. My strategy is to produce very artistic dishes that have a story, and that takes a lot of time. Trevor loves his fine details. He just loves to make sure that everything is absolutely perfect. Stay focused, buddy. Oh, yeah. Trevor, let's go! Guys, you can get it done. You got this, girl. You got it. You got this, Taya. Come on, you got this. Trevor, yeah. It's down to the wire on every plate. Ah. This is the most pressure I've ever felt in this kitchen. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And hands up. That was intense. Absolutely gorgeous, Trevor. Woo! All right. Trevor and Taya, please keep working. Your appetizers look fantastic, and we can't wait to try them. The judges will now head into the dining room to privately taste both appetizers, while the home cooks continue with the entree round. I feel like I nailed the appetizer round. It's exactly how I wanted it to look. It's exactly how I wanted it to taste. Trevor should be incredibly scared because I know it tastes good. I've been studying plating, and it definitely shows in my appetizer. First is Trevor's braised and grilled octopus with purple and gold fingerling potatoes and a deconstructed lemon tartar sauce. 
So immediately, I could see this is a dish that Trevor thought very carefully about. This says elevated cuisine to me. But let's see how it tastes. Wow, that's incredible. The octopus is cooked to perfection. It's fresh, it's clean, it's tender. He was able to get the octopus to have a great flavor from that broth that he cooked it in. I think it could have done with a little bit more charring on that grill just to give it a little bit more crispness and a touch of smokiness to it. The flavors of the aioli are incredibly bright and very, very tasteful. And the potato chips, nice and crispy, thin, perfect size. Next up is Taya's appetizer, a Mexican street-style corn with a corn panna cotta, zucchini blossoms, a jalapeno lime puree, and a watermelon and mint amuse-bouche. To me, it's clear that Taya has managed to elevate her plate presentation. I think this dish is her defining moment. We have never seen a more elegant, beautifully presented dish from Taya until now. And we have an amuse-bouche as well. Wow, great beginning. The panna cotta is very good. A little on the sweet side, you get that big hit of corn and that charred corn on top. I thought it was just a very clever way to do it. This dish, I cannot see anything wrong with it. And this is very, very rare. Okay, coming from a demon chef, you got all the different tastes. You got the sweet, that's bouncing the acidity from the crema, you know, a little bit of hit slice at the end. The combination, it's amazing. She has really captured Latin American cuisine here. My whole menu is apples and kind of nature -y things. We're using a lot of fall rustic flavors, and I want to demonstrate how versatile an apple actually is. I have a lot of components and techniques to do today, so I have to really push myself and work really fast today. I cook with my family all the time, so this is just another day in the kitchen. Oh, yeah. Keep it going, Andy. I've been really fortunate to be able to travel a lot. Throughout this whole competition, I've been drawing on flavors from my travels. But what I'm doing today is bringing it back home. I want to show the judges not where I've been, but where I'm from. Let's go Dartmouth. <laughs> Becky is doing a scotched quail's egg, which is a British classic. Every pub, every little cafe, they will sell a scotched egg. Tricky business, though, because that quail egg can overcook by the time the crust on the outside is cooked. Those are adorable. Look how small they are. I make scotch eggs at home all the time. My dad and my sister really enjoy them. Eggs live in nests, so I'm putting it back into nature. <laughs> Andy, my man, how are you? Yeah. Question for you. Yes. How many Dornaires have you eaten in your lifetime? Uh, I've probably eaten more than I actually remember because there tend to be a late night snack uh, after the bar. But... <laughs> so for people who've never had a Donaire, can you describe one? It's street meat. It is a ground lamb kofta, like a big, huge kofta of ground meat that they shave off. It goes onto a piece of pita bread, get some garlic, onions, and then this strange, wonderful sauce that goes on it with made of evaporated milk, vinegar, and sugar. I'm elevating that, adding some champagne vinegar and some tahini. Well, I'm gonna leave you to it. Elevated, right? Yeah, I will. Thanks, Chef. Let's go, Andy. Let's go. Yeah, Andy. Becky, you're doing amazing. Those look great. <laughs> Becky's family is going to be absolutely shocked when they see how much she has grown as a cook. <laughs> Becky. Hi. What are you doing now? Spiralizing. No kidding. What's that? For the nest? Yeah. What's the cook on the quail's egg? Uh, find out when they come out the deep fry. I don't want to see a dry egg yolk. Okay. All done? Yeah. Have you cut into one? No. Are you going to do that? Later. Later. When Becky cooks, she is laser focused and anything around her is non-existent. I got a feeling that you want me to go away. Well, I got things you know? to do. You got things to do. All right, get the hint. <laughs> 30 minutes! Solid, Becky, solid, like a rock. Andy is incredibly intense. Whew, he moves fast. He's very competitive, but he's not gonna undermine you. He's like a stealthy competitor that you respect, but he very much wants to win.
Look, Becky's about to fry her first bird's nest using parsnip, sweet potato, and potato. Is she mixing all three starches together? It looks like she's doing that. That's not a good idea because sweet potato has a lot of sugar in it, which means that it will burn before the other potatoes are cooked. Becky is, like, really sweating. I think it's starting to get to her a little bit. Oh, Becky's bird's nest looks burnt. I'm just feeling a lot of pressure because I have a lot to get done. I've never seen her look so facile. I've never taken on this much before. I'm feeling very overwhelmed right now. Andy has his lamb loin in the oven, roasting off nicely. His pita chip and roasted eggplants are well underway. Everything he's doing is calculated and precise. Nice, Andy. You're in a groove here. This donair salad has a lot going on. How's it taste, Andy? Really good. <laughs> 15 minutes and 15 minutes left for your appetizers! Becky is already starting to plate her first course. I've never taken on this much before. I'm just nervous about the time. Andy's lamb loin needs to be medium rare. It's very tricky because of its small size. It's perfect. I'm so happy, such a relief. <laughs> this is looking incredible. Yes. Smells good in here. Yes, gorgeous. Andy's starting to plate now. And Becky, she's already finished her appetizers. Five minutes, you only have five minutes left. What's that, Becky? Prep it. I see Becky's strategy right now. She has made her appetizer easier to prep because her main course is very intricate. Becky right now is breaking down her rabbit saddle. The bones on a rabbit are very small. You have to have the hands of a surgeon to be able to do that. One minute! Servers are coming! <laughs> I'm focused on me. Becky's gonna do her thing. I've gotta do what I gotta do to get these dishes out. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hands up! Andy and Becky, please keep working. Your appetizers look fantastic. The judges will now head into the banquet room to privately taste both appetizers, while the home cooks continue with the entree round. I'm happy with the appetizer dish. It's like a thing in nature, and I transformed it into food. My appetizer looked great. These are massive flavors, and I hope the judges love them. The first dish is Becky's Scotch quail egg with pork and apple coating on a nest of potatoes and parsnips. I really enjoy the presentation because it's so natural. But I don't think you two got the better deal out of this because there seems to be a color variation. Some of the potatoes are burnt. Let's not forget, Becky had extra time. Yeah. She could have re-spiraled the potatoes, refried them, maybe a little bit less time in the fryer. Okay, let's try it. Yes, some of the potatoes are a little bit charred, but this dish is absolutely delicious. You've got the pickled pearl onions, you've got the charred leeks, the peeled cherry tomatoes. Those ingredients really help to counteract the fattiness of the other ingredients, and that's really intelligent cooking. I think it showcases a great deal of technique. Seasoning on the sausage meat, I thought, was spot on. The flavors are beautiful. The scotch egg, done to perfection. I'm very impressed. Next is Andy's appetizer, a Halifax Donair salad with spiced lamb koftas, seared lamb loin, pita chips, and evaporated milk tahini dressing. I think he's done a wonderful job reimagining a classic handheld dish. Let's taste. The loin of lamb is a delicious cut of meat. The kofta kebab is full of deep, long flavors, and that special sauce works very well with this dish. If you take the mint and this powder that he has on the plate, put that together. 
The flavors are amazing. Overall, this dish really conveys who Andy is and more importantly, how far he's come in this competition. I think we have a real race on our hands here. Let's go see how they're doing. These two home cooks really have very unique and different styles. I am making fancy ants on a log. A traditional ants on a log is you take a log of celery, you fill it with peanut butter, and then top it with raisins. It's a fun way to eat some vegetables. <laughs> Growing up, this was a snack that I had in my school lunch, and I just didn't think there was anything cooler than ants on a log. Jennifer! Hello, chef! Ants on a log. So how are you going to make it great? This version is with blue cheese, a celery juice vinaigrette, and pork poached eggs. I really want it to look like a bit of a sculptural art piece that you get to eat. Okay, well, you have always inspired us and impressed us with your beautiful plate. Thanks so much, chef. Don't let those ants run loose, eh? Okay. I'm working on the rundown, so I got a head, a tail. Oh yeah, boil it. I'm doing this for my dad. He always made rundown at his restaurant, and it would fly off the shelves. That's gonna cook up a bit. Hi there, Andre. Hey, chef. So tell me about your appetizer. A rundown is basically fish cooked down in coconut milk. And today I'm elevating it by putting lobster with a kalaloo puree and boiled dumpling. So I'm assuming that you've cooked lobster this way before, mate? Never. Never cooked lobster? Never cooked lobster. Do you think that was wise, pulling lobster out on such an important night like tonight? I got to pull out all the guns today, so. Taste every element, right? Yes. Seasons like a king. Roz, I need a sous chef, man. <laughs> 100% the hardest part of the appetizer for me is the celery. I'm a little worried because it takes a lot of skill, which she has, to elevate such a humble vegetable as celery. Because the backbone of this dish is celery, and Andre's is lobster, I have to allocate a lot of time and love and care into this celery to make it the best celery the judges have ever had. If she can pull this thing off, she's gonna wow us. Hey, okay. Yeah! Celery looks good! Thank you, thank you. I'm making the dumplings today like some gnocchi. It should take about five or six minutes to get a nice cook on it. Dumpling time. I'm looking down at Andre's station, and his dumplings aren't boiling. If they sit in just warm water, they get tough. I don't know what's going on with it. Not a good move. That's not good. I'm trying to shoot for the stars right now. I cannot make any mistakes today. Oh, dear. I want to make sure that it's cooked properly. So I change burners, and I put it on the blast burner, and I crank it up. Good. Do your thing. So you only have 10 minutes left before we start to taste your first course. We are moving. Time is the most important ingredient in this kitchen. Jennifer, what's next? I'm gonna make a blue cheese mousse. We're gonna stay focused. You got it. I still have to do so many other components. Almost, almost, almost. <laughs> My brain is just in this mode. Good job, Jennifer, good job. Look at those tails of lobster that he's just cooked. They look spectacular. He has amazing intuition. Oh, nice and soft. I'm gonna start plating. Five minutes! You only have five minutes before the first course. Both Andre and Jennifer right now are feeling the heat. Everything has to be beautiful because this is such a simple dish. More so. I want all of the bites to be perfect and all of the bites to be just a little different. Okay, here we go. One minute! That's One good. minute! Service is coming to pick up your dishes! You got this. Come on. Nice. That looks amazing. Wow. Thanks, guys. Looks fabulous. Thank you. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hands up. Wow. Andre Jennifer, please keep cooking. We'll excuse ourselves to the banquet room while we try your appetizers. The way I treated every element on this plate makes it a finale worthy dish. I hope so. I don't care that I never cooked lobster before. This is my last cook in the MasterChef Canada kitchen. You gotta go big or go home. First up for tasting is Andre's Lobster Rundown with a coconut callaloo puree on a bed of boiled dumplings. I love what I see on the plate. It's Caribbean carnival. It's all about those great colors. And I think the proportions are really spot on. You can see there's a lot of imagination behind the dish. It 
is a good balance of savory, sweet, bitter, and you can identify it all. Nothing is overpowering each other, which is very, very important. You can see the lobster is perfectly cooked. I can't believe this is Andre's first time ever cooking a lobster. This caralou puree. It is silky smooth, and I like the coconut reacting with the usually very bitter flavor coming from this very leafy vegetable. There's only one misstep, in my opinion. The dumplings are slightly tough, and that's because his water was not boiling. Oil. Next is Jennifer's appetizer. Fancy ants on a log made of pork poached figs, a celery brunoise, and a blue cheese mousse. She has taken a very childlike dish and elevated it to restaurant quality. I look at it and I can't wait to tuck into it. It seems almost simple in the beginning, but once you taste it, you realize the complexity, the fine detail, and the finesse to it. In there, you get so many complex textures. I get the crunch from the, the walnut and the celery. And then you have the blue cheese, full of flavor, but it's also balanced. It's very hard to balance blue cheese. There's so many different juxtapositions happening on this plate. It's a really, really smart dish. I mean, this is the kind of dish that you could see in, may I say, a Michelin-starred restaurant. This is just spectacular. When I tasted the lobster, I thought, how is a celery and blue cheese dish going to compete with a dish of Andre's caliber and quality? Any ingredient in the right hands can be sensational. Let's get back out there.